Hi, I'm Vishnu Srinivas and welcome to Hawk Guide. I started this podcast to give professionals an open platform to share their candid views on topics impacting businesses and economies around the world. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Joining me today is Helene Meisler. She is a columnist for Real Money. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So uh, would you like to start off with a short introduction about like your background and your role? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, as it happens, I just literally this week celebrated my 40th anniversary of working on Wall Street. So I've been around a long time. Um, <laughs> uh, I went to work on Wall Street in 1982, which literally was just a couple of months after the bull market began in August. So I've kind of, I don't want to say I've seen it all because I haven't, but I've seen an awful lot. Anyway, um, I went to work on Wall Street and um, not long, and I didn't know very much. I mean, <laughs> I didn't know anything, most people would say. Um, and, and I learned as I went. And uh, after a few years, I decided I wanted to work with our um, market technician uh, because I just liked what he did. And so um, I asked if I could learn from him and I basically became his assistant and apprentice. And uh, there you have it. And I, I stayed there. I was at Calendar Company and I stayed there until 1989. And uh, then I went to Goldman Sachs and I was there for a few years. And then I went to manage money at Cargill in their equity department in the early 90s. And um, then in 1996, my husband was transferred to Singapore. And so I quit my job and off I went, planning just to trade for myself. And it wasn't long after that, Jim Cramer had started the street.com and he had been a client of mine back in the eighties. And so he asked if I would write for the street while I was overseas. And we thought we'd only be overseas for two years. So I started writing and trading and here I am 20 some odd years later, still doing it. And, uh, and we, we ended up staying overseas for nine years, and, um, but now we're back in the States for 15 or so. Awesome. So before we get into some more specific questions about your trading principles and kind of your mindset, can you like kind of give us a picture of like, you know, working in this industry for 40 years, what are kind of your biggest takeaways or maybe lessons you've learned from just stock analysis? Well, gosh, the business has changed drastically in 40 years. Um, just to give you an idea, I um, when, when I got in the business, we didn't even have PCs. We didn't have computers on every desk. Um, that was it. Uh, that, that came sort of more in the mid, mid 80s. And um, so we, we did our stock charts by hand because if you didn't do them by hand, there was no other way to see them except for once a week when you got them printed out and delivered. So um, to this day, I still, as a matter of fact, since we're doing this as a show and tell, I will show you. I still do my stock charts by hand every day. Wow. Um, and uh, that's because when I moved to Singapore in 1996, I tried to give it up but I felt I didn't know what was going on in the market. So um, I, you know, could I give it up today? Probably, but I would, I feel like I would lose the feel that I've developed over all these years. Um, so what has changed? Obviously when I first got into business, um, we paid almost 40 cents a share for commissions to trade. And now there's zero commissions, so that changes. Um, when I got in the business, we traded in eighths and quarters. And now we trade in pennies <laughs> and that changes a lot of statistics and, and the way markets trade in general. So um, yeah, there's been a lot of changes in my time. And we, we didn't, we didn't even, obviously, we didn't even have computerized trading back when I first got in the business. And as a matter of fact, back when I first got in the business, a hundred million shares traded on the day was a big day in the market. And you know, now we regularly trade on, on the New York Stock Exchange. And now we regular, regularly trade four to five billion shares a day. 
yeah, that's just crazy. Time flies in 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> that it does. Uh, so now I guess where I want to go next is, you know, when you write about or analyze these stocks, how do you dissect the investor mindset in addition to just purely the company's financials? Well, I don't look at the company's financials. I look at how the company is trading. I look at the price and the volume. And, and I, I assume in my discipline that pretty much what every investor knows is currently represented in the price. Okay. And um, so, you know, if everybody thinks the earnings are going to be $5, that should be represented in the price. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's my assumption. Uh, but I... I I like to look not just at the stock chart, but I also like to look at what the sentiment is toward either the particular stock or the particular group. Mm -hmm. And I can give you a couple of examples, recent examples. So for example, back in September, all I kept hearing is interest rates were rising. All I kept hearing was how bad the news for the home builders are. The news right. is terrible for the home builders. The you know one after another, the home builders were reporting terrible earnings, and the stocks just weren't going down anymore. Interest rates were going up. Nobody was buying homes. New home sales were down. Existing home sales were down. New home starts were down. Everything was terrible. But the stocks had refused to go down anymore. So I look at that and I say, all right, what if you got a piece of good news? Maybe all the selling is finally done. Maybe all the news is finally priced into the stock mm -hmm. or the stocks in this particular instance. And maybe if you got a bit of good news, people would have a little hope. And they hadn't made, so, so the home builders had made a low in April when rates were much lower than they were in September. And then here we were in September with interest rates much higher and the news obviously much worse than it was in April mm -hmm. and the stocks weren't going down anymore. So I take the side that maybe we should be looking at them to buy because if you got any good news, interest rates go down. Home, you know, home buyers come out of the woodwork because, oh, look, I can buy more house now because interest rates aren't 7%, they're 6%. Right. And and obviously the home builders have rallied. Okay, I'll take I'll do the other side for you now. Um, the other side is in late October. Anybody you asked, I mean, one after another, everybody's favorite se sector was energy. Everybody loved energy. They all had the story: we're not making any more energy. There's, you know, what if China opens up from COVID? Yeah. Uh, you know, I could give you the litany of reasons why the, their good value. There was a whole lot body. And the stocks had stopped going up. They literally had gone nowhere from late October through late November. And that tells me what if all the good news is priced in? Maybe everybody who's wanted to buy the energy stocks have already bought. And now what you need is a shakeout. You need those weak holders to go away and give up. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen that the energy stocks have taken quite a tumble this week. Right. So um, that's how I tend to wrap the news in with the price. Does right. it, work all, it, it doesn't always work perfectly. I'm just giving <laughs> you two examples in the last few months that it's worked rather well. Sure. So, so it's safe to assume that you believe these markets are, are very efficient then? Well, not always. <laughs> I mean, times where they're not, obviously, you know, where uh, it doesn't, it, it, everything looks like it should be this way and then it isn't. Mm -hmm. So then they're not efficient, right? Right. So, so I'm, I my, guess... My basic belief is, is that the price is telling you something. So yes. Sure. So like kind of a naive follow-up would be if the pro if these stocks are priced in, how do you go about like finding edges then? Why hedge? Oh, sorry. Finding edges. Oh, edges. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> that's a good question. 
Um, I don't know. I feel like they just sort of come to me. Um, you know, um, it's it's one of these these things where I like to listen for um, sort of when everybody is on the same side of the boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, that to me becomes my edge. So, for example, I was negative on the bank stocks last week. Mm. Okay, and the banks have, are down nine percent this week. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, the banks are down. Everybody's come out of the woodwork. Oh, you can't like the banks anymore. Thanks, yeah, yeah. And now there's a whole litany of reasons why you can't like the banks. Right, exactly. You know, the economy is slowing and bad loans. And I mean, I could just list them all. And they're, they're not doing their buybacks like they were. I mean, I can give you all the reasons. And I look at it and I say, God, the banks are already down 9%. Maybe it's time for them to have a little rally. Especially being that if I, again, I look at the chart and I say a lot of them are sitting at some kind of a support level. So, so I just sort of, a lot of it is an, a, anecdotal, I guess, is, is I listen for when, um, I'll give you, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. There was a guy I worked with at Goldman who, um, a stock or an index or something was acting a certain way. So you go with the trend. It's going up, it's going down, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, and nobody would know why. There would be no news. And all of a sudden, some news would come out. And Steve would stand up on the trading desk and call over to me. Now we know, Helene. And, and, and that was pretty much how we look at it because now we know the news, now we can quantify how bad the news is, how good the news is. And, and so to me, that, that's the same thing I'm looking for. I'm looking for when does the news come out? We already know the banks have been acting terribly. <laughs> right. So when does the news come out? Now the news has come out. This week there was a bank conference and, and all the CEOs of the banks came out with all of these dire predictions. So now we know earnings need to be taken down. Now we know, so we can quantify it. And that's how you can begin to understand if, if the bad news is priced in or not. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, let's go more specifically to kind of your process um, in terms of like looking at metrics and statistics, uh, because I feel like a lot of investors, even like my age or like going into or and like going into like startup companies kind of stick by certain uh, stock analysis metrics and financials that they're taught like price to earnings, forward PE, like EPS, all these kinds of things. I guess, could you like point out some notable flaws that you might see in some of these commonly used metrics and maybe point to some that you think are maybe not as widely known or used? Well, everybody uses PEs. Everybody, you know, not everybody uses price to sales, but you know, they, they do. But PEs are just probably the most common. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with using PEs, except if the E goes down or the price goes down, it's a moving target. Yeah. I mean, they're not, I, I, think, I think if I had to say the most common mistake is to me as an outsider looking in, it is that people think the PE is a constant <laughs> and it moves. You know, if the right. price goes up and the PE moves up or, or if the earnings go, you know, so it's not always, it's, what I find interesting is there's an old Wall Street expression that you buy cyclicals, which are, tend to be like industrials, mm -hmm. when the price earnings ratio is really high and you sell them when the price earnings ratio is low. Okay, because you want to buy them at the beginning of coming out of a recession. And when you're coming out of a recession, the PE for cyclical stocks is terrible because the earnings are terrible, okay? And you want to sell them when you're at the top of the cycle and that would be when their PE is low because their earnings are good. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a moving target. It doesn't, it, you know, that would, that I guess if I'm looking for a flaw, I would say, I think too many people don't pay attention to that. Um, right. Now, what I look at is um, I look at the market, what I call the market internals. 
So mm -hmm. I look at what the breadth of the market is. Obviously, the more stocks that are participating on the upside, the more positive you should be on the market. The fewer stocks that are participating on the upside, the more bearish you should be. So I'm going to give you a little example. If everyone knows we're in a bear market, okay? <laughs> I mean, that, that should be no, no question now. Yeah. But everyone thinks, in, from what I can tell, most people believe that the bear market started just about a year ago. Because that's when the S&P peaked. Yeah. Now, it peaked in November, S&P peaked in January. Right. I think the bear market started almost, a, almost two years ago. Because if you go back and you take a look, the majority of stocks made their highs in the first quarter of 2021. And you, you can just go back and take a look. For example, NASDAQ had over 700 stocks making new highs in February 2021. We've never seen that again. <laughs> Yet the market rallied strongly in 2021. Right. And it rallied strongly because the market indexes were so heavily concentrated in a handful of stocks, five or 10 stocks. Okay. I mean, if Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, if they moved, the indexes moved. But every other stock was left for dead. <laughs> almost every other stock was left for dead like so if you owned energy in 2021 you're you were terrible you were way underperforming the s&p right and, i mean you know if you owned industrials if you owned banks if you i mean healthcare, staples anything those stocks all were going down and small cap technology was in a death spiral for most of 2021 all the money got sucked into these big cat stocks. And so I look at the breadth of the market and I say to myself, those big cat stocks are the generals and all the other stocks are the troops. And you can't fight a war with only generals. You need the troops. And slowly we were just picking off the troops one by one. And like each group was getting shot and taken out, not, not enjoying the rally. And so what you were left with by the time we came around a year later was the generals. And this year, what's happened, and well, and so in the first part of the year, everything sort of went down. Mm -hmm. Well, energy didn't, but, um, but mostly everything went down in the first half of the year. But since then, you've had industrials do better, much better. Um, you've had banks sort of sideways. You've had staples doing well. You've had drug stocks doing well. I mean, I can go on and on mm -hmm. and on. Um, but the bottom line is, is they're doing well because those mega cap stocks are not. So there's more money left around for the troops. It's like, now yeah. I can feed the troops. <laughs> Because the generals are not eating at all. And so that's when I, when I talk about looking at the breadth of the market, that's what I'm looking, looking at. I want more troops, fewer generals. Gotcha. So looking at the breadth of the market, you get kind of this holistic analysis that applies to a lot of different sectors, presumably. But do you also have kind of an additional analysis that you layer when you're looking at industry-specific kind of stocks? Um, no, like I mean, industry I, to industry. I mean, like just, no, I, I, mean, I, like I said, I put a pencil to the paper every night and on, on those charts. And it, this is going to sound very weird to certainly people of your age. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get a certain feeling that the stock wants to go down or the stock wants to go up. It's just, I, I wish I could give you a better example. Now, I think most people look at computerized charts and they put indicators on the bottom or the top, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, like RSI or stochastics or, uh, yeah. I don't use any of that because I'm, I'm old. 
Um, <laughs> because I do what I do and I don't have them on my paper chart. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, and so to me, I just take a look and I look for patterns and I look for for when when the stock gets tired of going down or gets tired of going up. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's I hate to say, I feel like a simpleton, but really <laughs> that, that's it. And, and so I'm also looking for the breadth of the market. Do I have more stocks that look like they're going up or do I have more stocks that look like they're going down or going nowhere? You know, there's a lot of times when you've got a lot of stocks and they're just going nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so when I do that, I look at what's called the advanced decline line. You can get it in the newspaper. Wall Street Journal provides that page for free. Um, so I look at how many stocks are up on the day, how many stocks are down on the day. Yeah. And I look at how much volume is in the up stocks and how much volume is in the down stocks. And then I look at how many stocks are making new highs on the day and how many stocks are making new lows on the day. Mm -hmm. So obviously when, when the market is in an uptrend, I want that new high number to expand. I want more new highs on a daily basis Yeah. or else something's not right. Sure. Yeah. Okay, when we're coming down, I want fewer new lows because that tells me the selling is drying up. And so to give you an example, go back to late September, or, or we could even go back to the spring, but let's just talk about in the May and the June timeframe. We had um, actually dating back to January last year in February, there were almost 1800 stocks made new lows on, the, on, the, on NASDAQ. Okay, again, everyone thinks the bear market started <laughs> last year. I promise you, we were well into it if you had 1,800 stocks already making new lows. Right, right. Um, and, and by the time the spring came around, in May, we had about 1,700 making new lows. And in June, when NASDAQ even made a lower low, there were only about 1,100. And now by the time September came around and we were even lower, there were only about a thousand stocks making new lows. So, you, you know, if you pictured a chart, the new lows were doing this. And that tells you that, let's go back to my discussion about those mega cap tech stocks and how they move the index. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were the ones getting sold hard in September. <laughs> Everything else had been down so much already, it wasn't really going down anymore. Right. They were struggling to break their spring lows. Right. Okay, so that's, that to me is a positive sign. When the index is, is going down, but individual stocks are starting to hold. It mm -hmm. means they're getting, I might use the expression, they're getting sold out. There are no sellers left. Yeah, okay. Okay, now let's take the most recent rally. And we had um, 140 stocks make new highs on NASDAQ in early November. I think it was November 1st or 2nd. Mm -hmm. And then we had a little sell off and we rallied again. And we, we could not make more than 140 new highs. Okay, no matter what we did, we had the big CPI day. You didn't get more than 140. You had the big supposed Powell pivot last week. You didn't get more than 140. Mm -hmm. You go back to the New York Stock Exchange had 98 new highs in early November. CPI day couldn't get you more than that. The Powell pivot day got you a whopping 104. That's it. You, I mean, that's not the sign of strength right yeah and then you get this week where the market tumbles right yeah, yeah. 200 points or whatever it was mm -hmm. and so you know that's kind of how i look at the market is how many stocks are participating how many stocks are getting bought on a regular basis how many stocks are getting sold on a regular basis and so that's what i when i refer to the market internals that's what i'm looking for yeah, sure. That that totally makes sense. Um, before we get into some prognostications, uh, just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to, um, you know, talk about a point that you, you know, emphasize strongly um, in your analysis, and that's 
you know, this consistent response that we've seen to overbought markets this year. Uh, when you look at reasons for this recurring pullback, do you, are there any like that pop out to you or do you think it's simply expectations that the market just has to correct itself? Well, I'm fond of saying that if you ask me to write a narrative on the market, I am certain I would get a big F for fail. Mm -hmm. I'm just terrible at it. But, um, you know, let's just go back to that discussion that I had about Steve, the guy at Goldman. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to me, if I'm doing my job, I should pick up the move before it moves. Okay. Mm -hmm. I should pick up that the market feels weak. I should pick up that the market feels strong. OK, and I should pick that up, not just in what we just discussed, all those statistics, but I should pick it up. And that is the market overbought or is the market oversold. And coming coming into last week, the market was creeping towards an overbought reading. OK, mm -hmm. typically speaking, when you get an overbought reading and you have those weak internals, those, you know, not not enough stocks making new highs and, and that sort of, or, or breath is not keeping up and you get a correction like we did this week. Then the news comes out. Oh God, what's the news this week? The news is recession fears. Right. Okay. So now we know, now we know why the market was acting so stinky <laughs> last week. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at some point, That'll all get priced in, all those recession fears. And the market will cycle back to an oversold condition. And all the news will get priced in. Despite the news being terrible, we'll probably get fewer stocks making new lows and we'll get an oversold condition. And so to me, the market is just responding to that. And then the news sort of tends to fit the, you know, it's, it's a, I'll give you this. Last week, when the market was just milling around on, on Wednesday, when um, Chair Powell gave his speech, mm -hmm. the immediate reaction to his initial comments was the market you know, went up and went down. It, it didn't really do anything. And if you were watching the commentary, almost everybody, oh, nothing new. He didn't change. And then what happened? The market rallied. And it rallied really hard. And so by the end of the day, all that, oh, he didn't say anything new. They were all looking for what did he say that was new? And stuff off. <laughs> yeah. He pivoted. Their initial reaction was correct. They were now just looking to react to why did the price move so much? And now this week, they have a whole nother story. <laughs> so you know, I'm like I said, I'm just terrible at all those narratives and probably best I stay away from them. I'm just better that, you know, when the news comes out, now I can assess where we are trading. Right. Yeah. How that we should trade going forward. Sure. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Um, so now I guess curious about a few of your takes uh, around the industry. So, one, do you think? It's safe to assume the S and P will continue to underperform going into next year. Well, it's interesting that you say that because in my column this morning, I wrote about the um, there are sixteen Wall Street firms that have published their year-end targets for twenty twenty-three, and this is about the time of the year they all do that. Yeah, <laughs> and they and most of them published their targets last weekend with the S and P at forty one hundred, and of those sixteen, eleven were under forty one hundred. So that's fewer than thirty percent, right? Mm -hmm. or, or well, it's uh, taken the other way. It's fewer than thirty percent are looking for a higher market next year. Right. Okay. Two were at 4,200, which is what, up 2%? And then there were three that were looking for something more modest, with the highest being up 10%. So I can't say how to quantify that in terms of where the market can go next year. 
yeah. I can just tell you expectations are really low. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and if I'm correct that we're already two years into the bear market, you know, it's possible that on the next leg down, we start to see stocks hold and feel better. And, 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 you know, because God, everybody's expecting horror or, or at least down. So, you know, there's an old saying that the market will do what it can to surprise the most. Mm -hmm. And right now, an up market next year would surprise the most. I don't see it yet. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I won't start to see it develop in the next couple of months. Yeah, definitely could be an interesting change of events. It's certainly uh, one thing I've got to keep in the back of my mind. For sure. Um, next, do you, uh, this is probably be some unsolicited investing advice, but uh, do you think that we might see a tech rally uh, towards the end of back end of this year? Or do you think investors should just take whatever profit they made post October? And Oh, God. Um, I think I don't really know. Um, and I'll tell you why I don't really know. I, I feel like a lot of those tech stocks um, have been sold out in the short term. I don't think they've been sold out in the intermediate term, which means I think if you took a stock like Microsoft, I think Microsoft, which had a, had a big tumble, mm -hmm. I feel like it can just do this for a while. It's, it's, it's quite common. It's quite common in, in downtrends and uptrends, but in downtrends, it's quite common to have a big leg down and not to V bottom, but to then just go sideways where people reassess and try and figure out, are we gonna come out on the other side okay? Or are we not, or are things gonna deteriorate? Mm -hmm. And so not everything goes down in a straight line, not everything goes up in a straight line. And so, if I took a stock like Microsoft, I think it's just in that period of time where it's had a big fall and now it's doing this. And at some point, I feel like it'll, you know, hopefully the pencil on the chart will tell me that Microsoft has done enough on the downside or maybe it's time for it to fall again. Um, but right now I just feel like so many of those stocks are at least, for, you know, the next week or two because you've asked me for the year end that's why i'm sure yeah, yeah. that that much short term i you know so so it's hard it, for me it's hard to say what i can tell you is that it is very rare to have the prior bull markets winners come out on the other side as the new bull markets winners <laughs> Okay, and, and tech stocks were definitely the prior winners. Right. So if you're looking for a new bull market in those stocks, yeah, yeah. you know, I think you may be barking up the wrong tree there. Um, you know, right now, the, the leader, you can't even tell, but it's possible the leader turns out to be industrials after they get shaken out. Hmm. It's possible energy does, you know, right now, the stocks that have been terrific are just so darn overbought. Yeah. It's hard for me to like them up here. Yeah, true. Um, but to to see tech as a leader is, I think, unlikely. And but I don't know what happens, you know, in the next three weeks. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, we'll we'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, last question. Um, I guess when you look at oil markets and you uh, put your pencils to paper, so to speak. Um, do you how much do you price in like the not inherent volatility of it and are you like do you look at it i guess in a different lens than you might look at other stocks no a chart is a chart is a chart um you know i i go with the assumption that humans are buying stocks and unfortunately try as we might human nature never changes mm -hmm. we're always excited at highs and scared at lows and um so no, to me, they should all pretty much trade the same. 
And so um, now, I mean, in, in the case of oil or energy stocks, you can take a look at the stocks versus the commodity. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, whereas you can't really do that in a tech stock yeah, yeah, or a drug sure. stock or, you know, but no, aside from that, it's, um, I would say most stocks should trade. I would, the difference, okay, I'll give you a difference. I think small cap stocks trade differently than large cap stocks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if I was looking at a small cap energy stock, to me, that trades differently than an Exxon or a Chevron because they're big cap. Just like some of those names, um, those small cap technology names are always going to trade differently than a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google or an Apple. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's the difference is, is in their market capitalization, not necessarily in their index, in industry. Yeah, a, a chart is a chart is a chart. That's a, that's a good mantra to live by. Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, yeah. it, a chart should represent all the human emotion that we have that's represented in the price. I, yeah. You know, and, and we're all guilty of it. I mean, you know, if you buy a stock and it goes up $5 in the day, you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you buy the stock and it goes down five dollars, you're like, "Oh God, what did I do? How do I yeah, get yeah. out? What do I do?" Right? I mean, it's not any different for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean this this is a great way to put a wrap on a um, fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Helene Meisler, for sharing your uh, valuable market insights and analytical insights as well. Um, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that. For more content, check out the rest of the videos on my channel. And be sure to look out every Thursday for a new episode.